Uh, one thing I was really happy about is I'm really glad that the witch from You Won't Be Alone stayed in Macedonia, grew up, and then started this, you know, queer refuge house. I, I love the continuity there. <laughs> right? And she seems so now. <laughs> <laughs> she looks great, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, it's David Stark from Watcher Pass, and then I'm talking to Goran Solevsky, the writer and director of Housekeeping for Beginners, which is coming to theaters on April 12, 2024. I'm going to talk to him right now, and while you're watching, if you can like, subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. I'll spread a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I've got Goran Solevsky, the writer and director of Housekeeping for Beginners, which is coming to theaters on April 12, 2024. It is another strange, raw, emotional story by Goran Solevsky. He is my favorite young director. I loved his previous two films, and I loved this film as well. I am very excited to talk to him, so thanks so much for joining me. Jesus. Thank you, sir. I'm very excited to be joining you. <laughs> of course. So I I've watched this a couple of times. I think I got the moral of the story. The moral of the story is that kids ruin everything, right? That's what you were trying to convey in this movie? Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. uh, just like abandon your children early if you can. Like It will be better for you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You know, it'll be easier. <laughs> you won't have as much turmoil. <laughs> there won't be That's legal crazy. issues. <laughs> so, Live your best life, guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so I guess, you know, where did this story come from? Was this one of the, you know, I think you had like eight treatments that you sent originally before You Won't Be Alone was made. Was this one of those stories? Was a new one? That yeah, came it out? was. It was um, one of 13, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, I wrote this like at one of, you know, uh the peaks of unemployment like one of the three times i was unemployed for two years you know like so it was something where i was trying to bury my anxieties about life and at the time about turning uh 30 and you know i used to be such a promising child and i was not turning into an adult that lived up to that promise so i just kept writing stories and this was one of them uh ones that i loved the most and connected to most intensely um the first moment of inspiration was a photograph I saw that a friend posted when he first moved to Melbourne in the late 70s. He moved in with his boyfriend and eight gay women in this household. And I just saw a photo from a day in their life. And I was like, that's a fun space to be in, you know, like this kind of cocoon of safety uh, where you can kind of live your messiest life, um, you know, in a time and place where that was a bit more complicated. Uh, I updated it to the present day, obviously, and shifted it to a country where, you know, Whose queer lives don't go and don't get documented very often, you know, if at all. Um, and yeah, it went from there basically. That is, uh, you know, amazing and also sad that a 1970s Melbourne, like Australia picture, is comparable to present day Macedonia in terms of like cultural mm. acceptance. But uh, also, it's you know, really, uh, I mean, at least it's comparable. Like, there's some places where that's not even comparable. It's sort of like you hope the future is going to give you that, but you know, so. I think for most of the world is actually it's actually very complicated, and we get dis distracted about that issue here, um, on you know in the economically developed West where we see it as a stand-in for the world, and most of the world is not like that. Yeah, no, for sure. And I did love how like how they you know the homophobia and some of the racism was just kind of in there, but it felt very natural. It felt like it was just a fact of life, which lets you kind of experience it, but it didn't like call attention to it. It just made it a yeah. thing that these people have to deal with on a daily basis in order to kind of live their best life and try to make make it as a family yeah it's a frame of the story it's never it's never the central part because i think with a lot of you know uh stories you're telling about people who you know experience bigotry like whether mildly or intensely in their day-to-day -day life like i don't think there's any point at this time to just dwell on that you know i think uh a, a lot of us are kind of sick of just watching emotional violence take place and you know, at the same time, obviously, you don't want to dilute that, dilute what life feels like. You want to be honest and capture it. But I think a lot of the time you can do it subtly and kind of just build it into the context of the story rather than dwelling on it. You know, like this is obviously a very dark story for many reasons, some of them to do with demographics. A lot of them are more universal. Uh, I mean, I think everything about queer lives is also universal. That's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, I still, you know, didn't want to just dwell on the negative or the dark sides because... Um, no one's life is just social realism or miserabilism every single day, you know, every hour, every day. Like uh, most lives, even, you know, in the dire circumstances can take in notes and colors uh, and feelings from all, you know, all over the emotional spectrum. And I think it's fun and still kind of 
rare and invigorating to see like joy and you know music and laughter and jokes even at the most inappropriate times when it's a story about like you know whether an ethnic minority or uh you know a queer story so i was looking for those moments actively and chasing them i'm very grateful when i found them yeah no for sure and, and they were they were wonderfully portrayed in this movie uh one thing i was really happy about is i'm really glad that the witch from you won't be alone stayed in macedonia grew up and then started this you know queer refuge house i, I love the continuity there <laughs> right and she's she, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> she looks great too yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah. What was it like? No, it's great. like it's yeah. really funny because a lot of people don't recognize Anna Maria because she always played spend most of your one be alone in heavy prosthetics and in a very different state. Um, yeah, it's look, she's been a friend of mine for many, many years. You know, back during the sense of unemployment and rejection, like she read one of my scripts and was, you know, not not just like kind about it, but like saw saw me as someone who is worth talking to, you know, saw me as an artist that, you know, well, A, as an artist that, you know, has, uh, whose stories have value. So I've stayed in touch with her over the years and become close friends. And um, yeah, when it became early on, uh, apparent early on in, in the casting of this process, that we needed to find an actress who was going to learn the dialogue phonetically anyway, because the character herself is an ethnic minority in the film. I was like, well, I know who can do that. <laughs> She's done it for me before. And you won't be alone as well. She learned all the dialogue phonetically in two languages in that case. Um, and also she's just an anchor, you know, like I see, I don't see her, you know, I see her as a fellow auteur. Um, I think the film is the director and the film's in charge and the rest of us are at its service. And to have someone at your side who, A, is just there as quality control, whose taste and judgment you can rely on, and also who can bring so much and also, again, I edit my own films, so knowing Anna Maria is in a room or in a scene, you just know, like, at every point, if something's gone wrong with the camera or the coverage or whatever, you can just cut to a close-up of Anna Maria and everything's <laughs> fine. It, it will be self-justified because she is telling the story, often silently. You know, um, I cannot tell you enough how, on the low budget with a tight schedule, how much of a gift that can be at all times. Yeah, so, no, yeah. that's uh, she. She was like you said, the anchor, of the rock of this, you know, film and this family, mm -hmm. and it was great to see her again. Uh, where did you find mm -hmm. Samson? He was his, he was my favorite character. I like wore a tank top because that was basically his wardrobe in the movie. <laughs> you dressed as him, yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, like because. Uh, it was a complicated film to cause because of you know the nature of uh, well socioeconomic and cultural realities. Uh, Roma people aren't really welcome into any of the arts worlds, not just in Macedonia, across Europe. So there were no trained Roma male actors under fifty, I think, or under forty. Uh -huh. So it was always going to be street casting, and I had a dedicated casting agent who was just in front of the Roma characters. Which you know, ultimately it's half the cost. Um, so she um she was kind of making inroads into the community for three months before we shot and meeting people. And she found him around the same time, also sent me a clip of one time when he was in a school play. Um and I was like, okay, so if he fits the role, he wants to act. Then it was the stage of like telling him what the story was about, and you still cool with it, and then like because it's complicated to play a gay character um in macedonia much less between shutka um luckily he, he was cool about it and we could organize things it was even like he was working in a pizza shop seven days a week when we were shooting the shooting this film oh, so wow. casting him once he wanted to be in it the next uh obstacle was convincing his boss to let him go for four weeks and then keep the job and then the obstacle, you know, so we had to pay for that. Then the next obstacle was like hiring, finding someone else for the boss to hire and paying for their training and paying for their salary <laughs> on top of things. Um, so, yeah, that, um, you know, when you're making stories that are not like the thing that's easy to do, um, it, it, it comes up with challenges, but you also get gifts. Like, because how else, you know, I'm still always eager to find talents from places that don't get explored much, but it's also like, it's easier for me right now when we're doing a film like this to say, it's the only thing, it's the only way we can do it. We can't do traditional casting, so we have to put more effort into it and more logistics and convincing any, you know, uh, film 
set up that like we're gonna have to go to things about uh, go about things the hard way. It's complicated. Um, then you come up with the gifts that you know. Otherwise, I never would have been allowed to look for someone for this long and then be able to find them. Yeah, for sure. And also, you got the gift of his uh, younger sister playing Mia, which was awesome as well. Um, or no, maybe... no, it's his daughter. Oh, his daughter. Oh, his daughter. That's perfect. Yeah, that, that explains why <laughs> yes. they were so close. Uh, and my I... God, dude, it come in handy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly i was like they have such great chemistry together <laughs> that makes perfect sense um one thing i wanted to ask the the it, movie ends with like i don't know kind of like a kid's rhyme like a kid's song it's like beat 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 these lava something like that what was the significance of that is that just something like culturally i don't know about or was that something uh, you know that was significant to you or the the movie i think it was actually like um in the making of, of an age where i kind of discovered how much uh what music can do for a film uh, in terms of building story and, you know, something that's kind of enjoyable to watch and emotionally potent and all these things, but also like feels like daily lived life. Um, and that song that they sing, it's a slightly adjusted version. So it's the same song they sing at the start of the film as well. Um, and they adjusted for the setting, which was like, you know, the first day of school in that case. Um, it's it's a song that became hugely popular all across the Balkans. It's Serbia's Eurovision entry in 2000. Oh, wow. 21 or something 22 um and the song became a massive hit actually even outside the country there were italians who recognized it which was cool um and it was something that everybody listened to from artsy intellectuals to like grandparents to ordinary children and you know because it's kind of like a fun playful um chorus um but also the meaning of it is you just have to stay healthy stay healthy and in a story that revolves around someone who doesn't have that choice I think there was something about the child, like naivety of the words that also have a dark, uh, and the rhythm, but that the, they have a dark undercurrent that is off, that often goes unacknowledged. Um, just like life, it has all this brightness and light, but also has these difficult things that, you know, a five-year-old might not be aware of while they're singing. Um, so th that's how the song came into it. And I thought it would be the perfect place to end it because it captured so much of the film's energy as well. And the very final image of the film is not, you know, it's something that can still bring me to tears. It's not as playful as or as happy as the ones leading up to it. But mm -hmm. I, I wanted something happy to counterpoint it. No, that makes perfect sense. And it was a nice way to kind of like bring the film all the way around. I kind of recognize the, the music from the start. And uh, now I see why it's significant. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is Goran Stileski, the writer and director of Housekeeping for Beginners, which is coming to theaters on April 12, 2024. Like I said, I loved it. I think it's another fantastic story from his wild mind. I uh, you know, th think you should check it out. If you haven't seen his previous two movies, check those out as well and watch Housekeeping for Beginners and then wait for his next film. I assume it is going to be an English movie, maybe an English space opera, but we'll have to wait and see. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, wait and see. I won't, I'll give away no secrets right now. <laughs> Perfect. Next time. I can't wait. All right. Thank you so much, Gordon. <laughs> thank you, David. That was Goran Selevsky, the writer and director of Housekeeping for Beginners, which is coming to theaters on April 12th, 2024. It is Goran's third film and is another wonderful, strange, raw, but emotional drama. I have loved his previous two movies and I loved Housekeeping for Beginners. So I definitely think you should check it out when it comes to theaters on April 12th, 2024. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot. Make sure all my new content goes straight to you. Thank you. <laughs>